Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again. And today is May 4th. And as the young people say, may the 4th be with you. Before we start with Growth Path Challenge 75, you probably noticed I look a little different today. Yes, real patriots cut their own hair at home by themselves with an old pair of dog nippers. Now, I was afraid I was getting a little too handsome, and it might be a distraction for some of you out there. And I don't want to do that in the short time we get to spend with each other every day. So, this is my quarantine haircut. And with that, let's start Growth Path Challenge number 75. Slide number one is tissue from a piglet. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay. Time's up. This is a very young piglet, probably only a couple days old. May still has an umbilical cord attached. We can see that there are areas of ulceration, which is surrounded by proliferation. These are pox. We see them a lot, especially on the skin of multiple animal species. The morphologic diagnosis is multifocal to coalescing, proliferative and ulcerative dermatitis. And the cause is porcelain pox virus. Remember that in most cases, pox virus uh, is transmitted either by direct contact or by biting insects on lightly haired area of the skin. But this is a really young animal, and a lot of these animals now are, are raised in confinement, don't have access to the outdoors or insects or anything like that. So how did this young animal get pox virus so quickly and such an advanced case? Well, pox virus is a virus that has the ability to cross the placenta. So if the mother's infected, there's a chance that you could have animals that are born with developing cutaneous pox viral infection. So you can see it in very young piglets. Some of you might have looked at this piglet and said, wow, it's really young and it's got some ulcerated areas. I think I'm going to go with Staph hyacus, the cause of agent of exudative epidermitis. Not such a bad thought, but unfortunately, not going to get you a lot of points on your examination because these are classic raised pock lesions with central necrosis. Slide number two is tissue from a kitten. You have a control rib plate on the left. So focus on the rib plate on the right. Okay, time's up. Well, there are numerous swellings on many of the ribs, some have multiple. And when we look at the costochondral junction, it looks pretty good. So there's no way this is rickets uh, in this particular animal. These are multiple calluses. These bones were fractured, probably during parturition. Um, the animal's got a little size on it, as you can see, it's composed of this uh, smaller kitten over here. And these are pretty healthy looking calluses. And this is a condition that is seen in people, certainly, that is seen in certain types of sheep, like grande sheep, and spontaneously can pop up in other species. Cats, are, it's not an unusual problem. And the condition is known as osteogenesis imperfecta. I think for this, I would ask for a uh, name the condition and the cause. I don't think that multiple rib fractures and callus formation makes much for much of a, uh, a morphologic diagnosis. That is the result of likely birth trauma. Um, it is likely that there are other bones that are affected in this particular animal. Osteogenesis imperfect is a very interesting condition. Hasn't been definitively proven in cats yet, in people and in sheep, we know that it's a deficiency of the COLA-1 and the COLA-2 gene, which are the ones that make the type A protocollagen molecule. Um, and so we are going to have problems in a number of organs uh, which utilize type 1 collagen. Uh, tendons, tendons in these animals are going to be somewhat hypoplastic. They're going to be lax because there's also type 1 collagen. You often, in, in association with osteogenesis imperfecta, will have odontogenesis imperfecta as well. And the teeth will be small, misshapen, and they'll have a very thin layer of dentin. So they'll look bluish. Uh, because you can see the pulp through the thick, thin dentin and enamel layer. The sclera of the eyes, another place where you have uh, this type of collagen, will be very blue and not the traditional white. 
this is a uh, condition, most conditions that we see in bone are typical osteopenia, which means not uh, enough bone and mineral. Well, this is more than that, okay? You have not only a decreased amount of bone, but the bone that's there is not put together well. So it's a decreased quantity and quality. It is the only disease in animals in which you have both decreased quality and quantity of bones. All the rest of them generally revolve around decreased quantity. We talk about osteopenia associated with everything from starvation to immobilization to steroid administration and other diseases. It's all a decreased quantity of bone. This one is a decreased quality. These bones are brittle. It's also known as brittle bone disease and they fracture. And these animals do not do very well. Slide three is tissue from a turkey. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis? And two possible causes. Okay, time's up. We have swelling of the infraorbital sinus. Push on this, you might get some goo goo that comes out of the nostril. And uh, then you have to think about a number of things that cause sinusitis, that's upper respiratory infections, sinusitis in turkeys. I think one of the classics. Uh, the classics are usually bacterial diseases, but there are new, some new viral diseases uh, on, the, on the rise. I think that I'm going to start with a classic, which is called turkey sinusitis, and it is due to uh, mycoplasma galliceptical. Mycoplasma galliceptical uh, affects turkeys, it affects chickens. Uh, you can also see some synovitis associated with it. We tend to think of uh, mycoplasma galliceptical affecting the primarily the sinuses, um, but they, it can and, and there are related mycoplasma, like mycoplasma synovia, which will affect the synovium. And sometimes you'll culture the wrong one in the wrong place. I see a number of cases in poultry in Maryland of uh, infectious sinusitis caused by mycoplasma synovia. So, but let's go mycoplasma galliceptical. It's a classic disease of poultry. You can see in other birds, including finches um, and wild birds, uh, which can harbor it as a reservoir. Uh, something else that you want to think about is Bordetella avium causing infectious sinusitis in uh, turkeys. Like mycoplasma, it loves places. It wants nothing more out of life than to become a cilium. So what you have is places that uh, have cilia like the sinuses um, are going to be rife with some of these agents and, and Bordetella avium uh, causes infectious sinusitis. I think that they might have changed the name on that one. No, I guess they haven't, but they have ordered, added another uh, Bordetella species, that's Bordetella hensii, which can cause this particular condition. Can I give you one viral disease that uh, is probably worth knowing, and that is avian pneumovirus, which can cause uh, exudative sinusitis and swelling in poultry as well. Okay, so that's a couple of good rule outs for sinusitis. You know, poultry is not my strong suit. I don't do a lot of poultry. Uh, so these are conditions and agents that I've had to, you know, when I took the boards, I really had to focus on them known for a couple of days because I've been fortunate enough to teach a lot of these diseases over the years. They've sort of kept uh, in my mind. The bane of my existence is when they change the name of something after 25 or 30 years. When you learn it one way, it's really hard to, to change. Okay, slide number four is tissue from a horse. Can you give me Three potential rule outs. Okay, time's up. I think we could probably agree on one, but when you see uh, lesions on the penis of a horse, you wanna think about a couple of different conditions and then sort of noodle around with them. Um, they all can be proliferative. Um, some tend to be more ulcerative. When I look at this one, I tend to see a proliferative lesion here. So we have several possibilities here. 
Um, my top three, whenever I look, think about penis of a horse, is going to be uh, squamous cell carcinoma, sarcoid, and habernema, or a summer source. Those can all be fairly proliferative. Um, they often have an ul uh, a ulcerative component. I think you also need to think about papillomas now, um, and especially the con the uh, the connection between equine papillomavirus uh, two and uh, genital squamous cell carcinomas, and then melanomas can occasionally pop up. So when we look at this one, I see, and then let's not forget about uh, uh, exuberant granulation tissue. Um, this is an area where if the animal cuts its penis on a sharp piece of wire or something, um, because of the motion, because of the constant moistness, you have a tendency for granulation tissue to grow faster than the wound can be re-epithelialized. So I think you could consider that. When I look at this, if I'm going to pick one of my top three, I think I would make this one a sarcoid. Remember, the sarcoid is a uh, neoplasm that is derived from a papillomavirus from another species, papillomavirus one and two from cattle. Usually horses will pick it up when uh, they will cut themselves somehow on a fence post or a nail, which is contaminated with bovine papillomavirus. The, the virus is injected at that point. It takes six to eight months for that to uh, uh, develop. And then you get these sort of verrucous growth. So I put that one on top of my list. Could it be a squamous cell carcinoma? Certainly could be. Um, could it be a uh, summer source? Those tend to be a little bit more ulcerative. Um, and then granulation tissue. So my top three on this one, sarcoid, granulation tissue, squamous cell carcinoma. Here's a fantastic picture from Paul Stromberg. I've been using this one for years. Uh, it's in the current edition of Jubb and Kennedy. It's tissue from a pig. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis for this lesion? Okay, time's up. This is an incidental finding. Um, you can see it in Slaughterhouse. Nobody really knows that much about it or cares. It doesn't cause any problem. We are looking at a section of gut. It looks a little bit like ileum to me. And then we have these bubbles all over it. This is a condition that is known as mesenteric emphysema or serosal emphysema. Some people would call it intestinal emphysema, but it doesn't really affect the intestine. These are dilated lymphatics in the serosa, and they fill up with gas, and nobody really knows where the gas comes from. Some of these may be are surrounded by multinucleated giant cell macrophages, and so people say, well, it's probably some sort of clostridium or a clostridium perfringens, one of the normal flora that somehow uh, is producing gas and it gets into lymphatics. We don't really know. Nobody pays a whole lot of attention except to take pictures because it's very photogenic. And a great picture, once again, by Dr. Paul Stromberg, who I owe a great debt because he's been so uh, such a, a mentor to me over the years. I've been able to use his images. We have talked together. and. Uh, I think he's one of the greatest pathologists um, that we have ever turned out. Slide number six is tissue from a polar bear. A polar bear from the University of Georgia? That's crazy, but that's what it is. So it's a polar bear, and I need for you to give me the cause of this lesion. Okay. Time's up. There's these little white, white dit dots within the myocytes of the skeletal muscle of the diaphragm. This is one of the reasons you don't want to eat polar bears. Uh, you also don't want to let, let polar bears eat you. But uh, what these little, oopsies, what these little dots are, are these are individual myocytes which contain larval forms of a aphasmid parasite, which is known as Trichinella nativa. Now, Trichinella spiralis is the one that we're mostly familiar with, and we are, uh, that's one that is spread by pigs. And certainly, Trichinella nativa, the one that is seen in Arctic regions, can be seen in pigs, wild boars. It's seen in a wide variety of uh, animals. It's also seen in uh, uh, marine 
mammals and other aquatic animals. You see it in bears. Um, so a lot of the animals up there will be infected. The adult aphasmin female will lay her eggs in the uh, crypts of Libricum, which are the crypts within the intestine. Eventually they pass on the feces. They will just be ingested by another animal. Um, I got, I'm sorry, I'm screwing this one up. I don't deal with chickenella a lot. Okay, so basically she, she lays her larva there, there are in the crypts of Libricum and they migrate through the wall of the gut. It makes a whole lot more sense. And then they get into lymphatics and they get, go all over the body. And, uh, and eventually they will find their way as they traffic through organs to skeletal muscle. Uh, one larva will enter uh, a myocyte and get all curled up and grow and turn it, uh, do some modifications of a cell so it becomes a nurse cell. And the nurse cells aren't that much different. They're still living cells, but they have a thick collagenous wall, which helps to protect these larval trichinella from the body's immune surveillance system. So, and they will live there until either the larva dies and they will be calcified, or that animal will be eaten by another animal. So somebody uh, eats the pig, the bear eats the pig, the pig's infected, or whatever. And that's the life cycle of trichinella. There was a great case this year in the, uh, uh, I think it was last year, the Wednesday slide conference. And it was submitted as trichinella. And every once in a while, unfortunately, we have to disagree. And it turns out that hookworms will do something that is very similar. Um, and they will migrate into the, uh, the skeletal muscle. They will take up residence within individual monocytes. The difference between hookworms and trichinella is trichinella uh, once you get in your cell, you modify it, and then you're there for the rest of your life. You know, wouldn't it be terrible to be one of these parasites like chickenella and have claustrophobia? I worry about that sometimes. Uh, you know, you're stuck all cramped up in this place um, for the rest of your life. So, so uh, but hookworms, they don't modify the cells, and they tend to move from cell to cell. They're always on the move. The body's trying to hunt them down. So, uh, it's a little different, but yeah, they will present the same. And you can see hookworm uh, larva in muscle, if you look very close, that look a lot like this. And that's a pretty easy mistake. I probably would have been made. We're very lucky at the JPC to have Dr. Chris Gardner, an old friend from AFIP days, review all of our parasite cases. And he keeps us on the straight and narrow. Okay. Slide number seven is tissue from a cat. Can you name the disease? Well, of course you can name this disease. We talked about it yesterday in a sheet, but I wanted to show you this one because it looks a little bit or a lot different. Um, this is also polycystic kidney disease. And one thing that you'll notice is that the cysts are very different in size. There is a lot of white material, which is fibrosis throughout the rest of the kidney. This animal is just as dead as the one that I showed you yesterday, but it took a while. This is what you usually see with adult, uh, adult dominant forms of polycystic kidney disease. Okay, you get the gene, very strong gene from one of your parents, and then you develop polycystic kidney disease. It's not like when you get it from both of your parents, you don't have any chance, and your uh, kidneys come out very large, sort of gooey, um, they never formed. This one formed okay to start, but there are changes in the genetics here. Um, you have the PKD gene, you have the PKH gene. These are, uh, allow a number of things to happen, including uh, de-differentiation or an increase in growth in tubular epithelium, and it disrupts the normal uh, development and uh, function of the tubules and eventually you get these large ectatic tubules and cystic uh, Bowman spaces. They get bigger and bigger, they will coalesce, they, you will have fibrosis. But it takes a couple of years to get to the point where this unfortunate animal passed away due to chronic renal failure. This is what you see with the adult dominant forms of the disease, very different than the adult recessive forms. 
Slide number eight is tissue from a horse. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis for this one? Okay, time's up. We have a very large neoplasm and it is in the area of the airway. Big bronchus, occluding the bronchus. These tumors are almost always right around bronchi and uh, sometimes like this they will they will occlude, they'll get big enough to cause problems with the airway. And this is a granular cell tumor in a horse. Granular cell tumors um, are seen in a wide variety of spaces. The only thing that sort of uh, has them lumped together in the same category is their appearance on H and E, their neoplasm, or their neoplasm that has a lot of granules. I mean, colloidal cells with a lot of granules, which will stain PAS positive in uh, on a special stain. And so they look a lot alike, but they are of, of varying origins. Um, the granules, uh, after most of these were named, have been identified as quite a few different things. Uh, some of them are lysosomes. Probably most of the, the ones that we see are uh, in granular cell tumors are lysosomes that stay positive. Some uh, ended up being mitochondria. And so granular cell tumors of the larynx became laryngeal rhabdomyomas. And, and so investigation told us a little bit more about the origin. Uh, in the horse, these are generally positive for S100. Not a difficult diagnosis to make anyhow, but uh, people have done special stains to see what stains. Uh, in rats, they're often seen in the meninges. In dogs, you can see them throughout the oral cavity. Uh, in the tongue, uh, in cats, they've been seen in, in various areas. I recently saw one in the esophagus, but they've been seen in the skin. Um, so it's not a great name, um, but that's what we're stuck with at the moment. But uh, in horses, they're a very well-known entity uh, affecting the airways and around the airways. Tissue from an ox. Can you give me the pathogenesis of this lesion? Okay, that's a horrible question to ask because there are pages written on this in Jub and Kennedy. Well, maybe a page and a half. Um, so that's a really long thing. Remember the pathogenesis, you have to have several, you have to have the initial cause, the final lesion, and several cogent steps in the middle. Um, and you can do a lot with this. Okay, so we're looking at the rumen. And you can see that there is a definite color change and some of the mucosa is, is sloughed off. Uh, you can also see that down here. Now, the first thing I wanna mention, and I think one of the real reasons I like to put this slide in, is that you can see mucosa come off in any rumen that the animal's been laying around and decomposing. Uh, what you won't see is this color change and you won't see any other evidence or any history that the animal uh, was in lactic acidosis. But in an animal that sits in the cooler for 48 hours, 72, you can pull that mucosa off um, if you want. So that doesn't mean the animal had lactic or luminal acidosis. It's just a normal feature. But I think this is a good one. We have a lot of edema. We have uh, a color change here. And so, and hopefully we would have gotten a history that this animal broke into the feed room or, or there was a misfeeding or something like that. Okay, so our initial insult is increased amount of, of concentrate, okay? Our final lesion is mucosal ne necrosis and loss. So let's think about all the things uh, that are important that happens in between those and that results in the death of this animal. Well, when you give the animal a lot of concentrate. Okay, they'll start to digest it and the pH of the rumen is going to drop from its normal 7.5 and it's going to head downward because of the acid that is produced. When it gets to uh, pH 5 or so, things start to happen. You lose a lot of the positive gram negatives and protozoa that live in there. Um, because the rumal floor is in a very delicate balance. And you start to see some very uh, uh, unpleasant gram positives pop up around 
pH of five, you'll see strep bulbus. And strep bulbus, one of the things that produces a lot of lactic acid. Lactic acid is not a good thing um, because uh, it does a couple of things. It drives your pH even further down. Also, it sets up an osmotic gradient. So you start to get water that comes into uh, to the rumen, um, so-called third spacing. Um, as the pH continues to drop, at, at around 4.5, um, you get lactobacillus overgrowth. And if you thought you had some lactate from uh, strep bovis, you get a lot from lactobacillus. All this time, you get a lot of production from these agents of volatile fatty acids like propionic and butyric and, and, of course, lactic acid. And there are receptors in the room. And when you get to a critical level, the level of this volatile fatty acids, for some reason, I don't know why they're there, but it shuts down ruminal motility. So you have this sort of big bag of fluid that's getting fuller and fuller um, and swelling. Um, and in addition, it also will shut down salivation in the animal. And saliva in ruminants is a very important source of bicarbonate, which has been trying to buffer this process. And so that's gonna get shut down. Um, and then we have significant problems. Uh, we're going to have metabolic acidosis. We're going to have um, a lot of things. Uh, and eventually hypovolemia. The animal will be very sick. It may, of course, die. Um, one of the sequelae that you'll see in animals in, who have uh, areas of the mucosa that have come off, if they survive, well, is due to one of the bacteria that uh, uh, normally lives in the stomach and will tolerate these low pHs very well. And that's Fusobacterium nephrophilum. Uh, everything sort of sinks down, Fusobacterium. And most of your ulcers are going to be down in the ventral compartment of the rumen. But if you see one of these animals that have, has lived for a short period of time, you will see ulceration and you may see uh, abscesses in other organs, including the liver, due to fused bacterium, which gets into the bloodstream at this point. Um, you may see uh, fungi. There are a number of fungi which tolerate this pretty well, aspergillus, mucor, and their, their, all of their cousins, and they will get into the bloodstream at this point. And then days to weeks later, you will see another round of ulceration because those Fungi got into the bloodstream, they formed hyphae, which damaged vessels distant to this, uh, distant to this uh, injury here. Remember, most of the injuries that you see will be in the rumen, but you can see these lesions in the omasum, in the reticulum, weeks after the animal has gotten into the feed. Okay, so that's a lot about this. There are a couple of, uh, just want to mention there are a couple of uh, plants that uh, you might want to know about because they cause a necrotizing rheumatitis that, call, that looks much like uh, this condition. And that would be uh, Baccarus corifolia, which is generally a, a uh, uh, plant that is seen in South America. And Kukuyu, a grass that uh, it's an invasive species that somebody thought, oh, it doesn't take much water. It'd be good uh, to play golf on. And so now we have kukuya all over the country and uh, animals that graze it can, a certain percentage, not too many, but a percentage, no one can predict which ones, uh, they react to kukuya and they get a uh, necrotizing gluminitis with a very sloppy mix of food in there, kukuya poisoning. Okay, slide number 10 is tissue from a cat. Can you name the condition? and tell me the composition of the whitish material uh, in the bottom half of the picture. Okay, time's up. Well, conditions for feline urologic syndrome, um, and there are a number of names uh, for that now, but uh, no apologies, that's how I named it. I think this is a great picture, and it shows a couple of things. Number one, this is a great case of cystitis. I, well, it probably was a male cat because it showed up on a picture. But whenever you have cystitis, I don't care, you have stones, you have bacterial infection, whatever, you're gonna have a reaction to the mucosa. And there's gonna be proliferation, especially if you have stones, you're gonna have 
a proliferative cystitis. Many bacterial infections will be proliferative uh, and ulcerative. Um, and so we have a fantastic proliferative cystitis in response to the presence of these struvite crystals. Now, unlike most other cases of, back, of uh, cystitis in cats, the struvite crystals um, that are associated with this are sterile. Many stones form in association with bacterial infection. The vast majority probably do for dietary causes. Um, but in pets, generally, back, chronic bacterial infection and uh, stone formation go hand in hand. Not so here. Okay, and you can see um, that the stone, this isn't one stone, it's a lot of sort of sandy material. So the concretion of these minerals and tan horseball protein uh, in a alkaline environment. So you can see why well, this animal blocked um, and did not have much of a chance. But I just put this up there um, because it really illustrates that struvite crystalluria sand formation and the proliferative nature that we often tend to forget about when we look at cystitis. Remember, I see a, a bladder, a morphologic diagnosis probably always going to include proliferative in it. Okay, well, time's up for today, I'm sorry. Uh, I promised you 10, 10 pictures every day. You got your 10 pictures. I think you're gonna have to wait till tomorrow. And then Wednesday, we have the publication of the results of the final Wednesday slide conference for 2019-2020. Um, and it's a great bone and muscle conference. So I know you want to come back to the foundation Facebook page to take a look at that on Wednesday. Hope to see you again tomorrow. Thanks so much for spending some time with me. And uh, everybody, be well out there and take care of the people around you.